Hopefully, can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> I can hear myself. <laughs> okay, let's pray before we get into God's word. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you this morning, even as we remember um, the sacrifice of your son on the cross. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we do not fully understand, more specifically the love that you showed um, by sending your son for us. And so we are blessed people, uh, even as we are in your presence today, and as we enjoy each other's fellowship and the company of believers and as we look into your word and as we meditate on your word Lord, we consider ourselves blessed and so even as we spend a few minutes in your presence once again to look into your word father we pray and i pray lord that you would speak through me um, that would essentially be invisible that you would the the people here would hear your word and that they would be blessed and so we pray that you would prepare our hearts lord today to receive your word in jesus name we pray Amen. Okay, good morning, everyone. So it's good to see you all. There's, uh, I usually stand here when I get a chance, I'll scan to see how full, to see whether or not the, the hall looks full, and it does. I do see some empty chairs, uh, and I know many of you are online as well, so welcome to you all. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I saw a news article recently, um, so it's maybe a few weeks ago, um, and this question came to my mind. Okay, so the, uh, the richest man in the world, okay, uh, I think it was last year, he spent $500 million on a yacht, essentially a boat. <laughs> $500 million is what he spent. Now, if you thought that put a dent into his fortunes, understand this, that in relative terms, $500 million for him is the same as someone who earns $65,000 a year spending $150. That's the kind of wealth the richest man has today. That's his net worth. But what does a man who has such wealth want to do next? Believe it or not, he is looking for eternal life. And by that, I don't mean that he is seeking Christ. I wish he were. He's not even looking for religion. Jeff Bezos is investing a part of his fortunes to unlock immortality. He's investing in the top scientists to figure out how to remove or reduce or decrease the aging process, the human aging process. He wants to try and reverse it. Now, I'm not sure if I should laugh or if I should feel sad. Here is the wealthiest man in the world looking for immortality, and he has money to give for it. And here we are, blood-bought children of Christ. We have eternal life because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. I'd like us to turn our focus today into God's word. And we'll spend a few moments in his word, and we're going to zoom into a portion of the book of Ezekiel. We are continuing on the series called The Names of God. There are a couple, of more, couple more to go. And today we are looking at one of the other names of God, and it comes from this prophetic good, uh, book. Let's read this portion together. It comes from Ezekiel chapter 48. I'm going to read from 30 to 35. It is really the last couple of words that speak his name. Ezekiel 48, starting at verse 30. These shall be the exits of the city. On the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, the gate of Levi, the gates of the city being named after the tribes of Israel. Verse 32. On the east side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Joseph, the gate of Benjamin, the gate of Dan. On the south side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Issachar, the gate of Zebulun. Verse 34, on the west side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Gad, 
the gate of Asher, the gate and the gate of Naphtali. The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits, which is basically eight kilometers. And the name of the city from that time on shall be, the Hebrew translation is Yahweh Shama, the Lord is there. Yahweh Shama, the Lord is there. The book of Ezekiel was risen, written 600 to 500 BC when the kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians. Many Jews were exiled and they were moved off. They were picked up, handpicked, moved off from Jerusalem and Judea to live in the other regions of Babylon. And you will know, those of you who know this, you will know and remember that the time of exile would last 70 years, according to the prophecy that was given to Jeremiah. Ezekiel, some have estimated, was around 25 to 30 years old when he was carried away into exile. He was a young man. And Ezekiel would live and die there, not having had the opportunity to finish all those 70 years and come back to see the reconstruction of Jerusalem. And it was while he was there and living in Babylon that God provided visions. The entire book is essentially visions. Um, and that is what is recorded in the book. And you will also note that along with Jeremiah, Daniel and his companions were fellow exiles in the land. Now, if you look at the book of Ezekiel, you can divide it up into three. I mean, of course, you can slice it and dice it different ways, but I would essentially group it into three. The first part of Ezekiel's vision, which starts uh, chapter 1 to 24, was concerning the people of Israel, or specifically concerning the kingdom of Judah, which was, as you know, Jude, um, Israel divided themselves, and Israel, the portion on the top was called Israel, the portion on the south was called Judah, there were two kingdoms, Jerusalem was the capital of Judah, Samaria was the capital of Israel, and so this vision was basically calling out judgment on the people of Judah. Remember, they have been conquered by Babylon, and they were a vassal nation. I, I think I explained what a vassal nation was previously in one of the, um, one of the um, sermons that I gave here. And a vassal nation is essentially when some other nation conquers you, and you essentially become slaves or vassal to, or they are the vassal, and you become slaves to that nation. And so you serve that nation. And so in, in spite of Judah being a vassal nation to the Babylonian Empire, they still remained rebellious. They were not willing to repent. And these, the first vision that Ezekiel gets in chapter, chapter 1 to 24, after he sees the glory of the Lord and his throne and all the strange things that he sees, um, God gives them, him a vision of what is to come to Judah because of their rebellion. And you would know from history that there was an uprising or a rebellion that occurred in Judah. And at that point, there was a second and a third besieging of Jerusalem. And the entire city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. The walls were destroyed. The prophecy did come true. The second part of Ezekiel's vision then shifts. This is from chapters 25 to 32. It shifts from all attention being given to Judah and judgment being called out on Judah to all the nations who are enemies of Israel, people who are arrogant or, or the nations that in their arrogance uh, would go out against Israel or stood against the God of Israel. And here's the interesting part. Many believe that some of those, that those prophecies have not yet come true. It is for a future time. Of course, there are a few who have argued that at least some of them have come true, but many believe that a lot of those prophecies uh, have not yet come true. So that is the second uh, set of visions that Ezekiel gets. The final portion of the prophecy or the visions is from chapters 33 all the way to the end in chapter 48, where he focuses on a final city a future city, and again, it is a city that no one has seen or heard. And in fact, uh, interestingly enough, Nishant brought up that from 
Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14 when he said that we seek a city that is not yet come or we seek a city that is in the future. And so it's interesting that we both landed on the same verse. And so he is, and so here is a prophecy of a city, a future city. You will see that the final prophecies that, or the final visions that are given to Ezekiel is all about hope. You move from judgment on Judah to the judgment of the nations, and then there is hope and reconciliation. It is a time when God will move his hand so that he will be able to draw people to himself. And he will once again, and the scripture says it and records it in Ezekiel, his glory will return to the city so that it dwells in the midst of the people forever. And it is this city, this final everlasting city, that is then given the name Yahweh Shammah, the Lord is there. Now I'm going to take a, make a side note here. The word Jehovah, so we sometimes say Jehovah Shema or Jehovah Jireh. The word Jehovah is actually a relatively new term. It is not found in the original Hebrew text. The right and more appropriate word is Yahweh. But the name Yahweh was deemed so holy that it was considered out of bounds for a normal Jew to say it out loud. And so what did they do? And I'm giving you sort of a history of how the word evolved. Because Yahweh, the word was, or the title was so holy and they were afraid of using that word in vain, what did they do? They removed the vowels so that what was left was, as in English you would see, Y-H-B-H, Y-H-W-H, which basically sounds almost like this. I'm not good at it. Yod, he, vav, he. And it's spelled in, in the English, and spelled in the English as Y-H-W-H or Y-H-B-H. They remove the vowels so that it is difficult for you to pronounce it, so you won't say it out by mistake. Now, of course, that makes it even harder for someone to pronounce it. And so as time went on, that got replaced by Adonai, which means Lord. And in some cases, they replaced with, when they recited, they would replace it with Elohim, which means God. It was actually only in the 6th century to the 10th century that scholars began to study this. And they looked at the strange characters, YH, VH, and re-added the vowels, but added the vowels from Adonai. And so you end up with Yehovah. And then they took out the Y and replaced it with J, which then became Jehovah. So the name that we normally use isn't actually the original name that the Lord revealed to the Hebrews. And so as to when in history did he reveal his name, most of us know this, most of us at least can guess it, it was to Moses, and you know that familiar portion of the burning bush. That is when most people believe God revealed his name uh, for the first time. Now hold on a minute. Genesis records Yahweh a lot, all through the portions of Genesis. You will know that even Abraham called the place Yahweh Yireh, which basically means the Lord provides. So why are you saying it is Moses? So scholars have theorized that Moses, because he was the one who wrote the book of Genesis, and because he was revealed the name when Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he always used Yah Yahweh in the text, and which is why you'd see those names appearing in the book of Genesis. Now again, I'm not gonna debate it. It seems like a good um, theory, I have no idea, but this is most, in, in the book of uh, Ex Exodus, when God reached out to Moses through the burning bush, that was when his name was revealed. And so it comes from Exodus chapter three, verse 13 to 15. Then Moses said to God, and you'll remember this passage, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is, your na what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, this is where he reveals his name, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered through all generations. So the implication of the word or the title Yahweh is in the meaning, or, or comes from the meaning, I am, the eternal, unchanging one, I am. He never uses it in the past tense. He is the eternal, unchanging one, and therefore he is the I am. So when we say Yahweh Shama, it is to mean I am is there, or the eternal existing one is there. There was one thing that haunted the people of Israel. They were haunted by this uncertainty around this one question. Is the Lord there with us? And you will see that scattered throughout the Old Testament. That is the question they always struggled with. Is the Lord there with us? Each time they were supposed to set out on a great mission, they would inquire through signs or through the prophets, anyone who is available, whether or not God's presence is with them. The scripture records great victories when they moved forward under his guidance and massive defeats when they ignored the Lord's command or assumed in error that the Lord was with them. You would know, for example, from Jacob as an individual when he was fleeing from his brother and running off to his uncle Laban, he had to pull over for the night and resting there had a dream. And when he wo awoke in Genesis 28, he said, surely the Lord Yahweh is in this place and I did not know it. And immediately after that, he pleads with the Lord for his presence to go with him rest of the way. Gideon, for example, asked for a sign. Inquiring of the Lord whether or not the Lord is truly with him because he was given an, a very important task to lead a bunch of men into battle. You'll find that in Judges chapter 6. Moses, again, pleads with God on behalf of the people. We kind of touched on that today when Jason, Jason brought it up from Exodus uh, 33. So Exodus 33, 15 says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us from here. It was always that the Lord needs to be with us, otherwise we do not want to proceed. The assurance that God was there with them was that important first step before the, a Jew took any important decision in their life or set out to do an important task. It was an assurance that they were going forward in obedience rather than being guided by their own personal desires. That was the mark of a Jew, pausing and inquiring of the Lord before moving forward. Of course, you would note in, um, in the book of Exodus again that God's presence was visibly manifested as the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness. His presence never left them, visibly present, by day as a cloud, by night as a pillar of fire. And after that, he instructed the people to build a sanctuary, a tabernacle, so that even when they rested, God is not leading them, God is actually dwelling in the midst of the, his people. The way the, the way the sanctuary is built and the instructions given on how the tribes would spread apart around the camp ensured that God's presence and his glory dwelt with his people. Exodus 25, 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. When they rested and camped, his glory would fill the tabernacle and it would stay there until the glory lifted again, which was a sign to the people that they have to pack their bags and start moving. He didn't stop there. He asked them to build an ark, an ark, the ark of the covenant, the ark of the testimony, or the ark of God, as a sign of his goodness and his covenant towards them. 
And so in the indwelling or the dwelling in the ark was a sign of the covenant that he established with them. What was inside the ark of the covenant? The Ten Commandments, the two tablets that hold the Ten Commandments. Aaron's rod and a part of manna symbolizing his promise and his presence with his people. And every time they went into battle with God by their side, they were victorious. Yahweh Shammah was with them. However, the scripture also records on many occasions that the children of Israel in disobedience rushed into battle without God and they faced massive losses. One of the most startling examples comes from 1 Samuel chapter 4. It records one such incident where the children of Israel, despite their sin, despite their unrepentance, audaciously tried to drag God into a battle thinking that his presence would ensure victory. The story goes like this. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 4. The Philistines and the Israelites meet on the battlefield near Ebenezer. And in that initial battle, 4,000 soldiers from the army of Israel were killed. Baffled by their loss to the Philistines, they asked in verse 3, it says, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? And instead of pausing there and introspecting, as should a Jew do, they came up with this bright idea. Verse 4, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Verse 5, they bring it into the battlefield. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. It goes on to say that on hearing the news of the Ark entering the battlefield, the Philistines almost gave up hope because they knew and it, they testify of it. They said, this is the God that struck down the Egyptians. What can we do? But instead, what the Philistines did was that they mustered that last bit of courage and fought on. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home. Imagine, they did not even run back to camp. They ran all the way home. And there was a very great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli Hophni and Phinehas died. The children of Israel tried to use the Ark of the Covenant of God as a way to force God to act on their behalf when they went into battle, incorrectly thinking that God is confined in a box like a genie. And in that battle, 30,000 people died. And the two sons, the wicked, wicked sons of Eli, also died. And far worse, the Ark was captured by the enemies. And the story ends there, or that portion of the story ends there, with a little boy born to a dying mother, the wife of Phinehas. And as she was giving birth or gave birth and she was about to give her last breath, the midwife tried to encourage her, saying, look, don't lose hope. Your husband has died. Don't lose hope. To you is born a son. And instead, she names him Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. What a far cry from the claim, the Lord is with us. Those who were humble enough to know when not to proceed lived another day. But those who were foolish enough to ignore God's counsel made their way to destruction. Now, coming back to the book of Ezekiel, the vision that God gave Ezekiel was a prophetic vision, and we looked at this, talking about a time that is yet to come. Fast forward 600 years from the time of Ezekiel, 
and you see that kingdom unfolding with the birth of Jesus. Once again, that sound of hope returning to the children of Israel. God, once again, seeking out the lost sheep of Israel, only to be rejected and nailed to the cross. Because to the Jews, the kingdom was supposed to come by force. They expected their Messiah to come in force and conquer the Romans, wipe them out. Instead, what they saw was a man riding a donkey into Jerusalem. A man who dined with sinners, no fixed address, the son of a carpenter from a town with a bad reputation called Nazareth. Funny enough, through his divine plan, even through the wickedness of his people, God brought about redemption. And this time, he brought about not just the redemption of the house of Israel, he included us Gentiles. And those who accepted his message, embraced the gospel message, became citizens of that kingdom. The scripture, the Bible, closes off as well with the ushering in of the kingdom. In those marvelous messages from, or verses from the book of Revelation, the same eternal city is spoken of in that book as well. I mean, we read it, look at the similarities and look at the differences. Revelation 21, starting at verse 10. And he carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit, sorry, to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates were the name of the 12 tribes of the son of, sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And on the wall of the city, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. What a blessing it is to see that in the progressive revelation of Christ, what was previously only the tribes of Israel being named, here we have the 12 apostles of the Lamb being named as well, carved into the foundations of that city. It is an important significance to us because we Gentiles also have access to that city. Verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple in that city, for the temple, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no sun, sorry, the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it life, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its city will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Now this city, as much as it serves as a beacon of hope for people, people like us, it is also a warning to the people who are outside it. Because this city is not open to anyone and everyone. It cannot be accessed at one's pleasure. Even as a city is to bring blessings to all the nations around it, it stands as an exclusive city that is restricted only to those who belong to Christ. They are the only ones who can enter the city. Verse 27, it says, But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 22, 15 said, says, outside are the dogs. And you know the reference. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Outside are the dogs, which essentially means the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the sorcerers, and the sexually immoral, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Those who have not been washed clean by the blood of Christ, those who continue to reject Christ and embrace sin, those whose names are not found in the book of life shall never enter that city. And as the scripture records in Luke chapter 15, many will strive 
to enter that city. Verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. When once the master of the house has risen and, risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. And then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught on our streets, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself cast out. And the people will come, and people will come from the east and west and from the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Only those who have a personal relationship with Jesus will enter that kingdom and that city. As the verse suggests, verse 26 suggests, you may have been in the very soon same room with Jesus. You may have dined with him. You may have listened to him. You may be in the presence of believers in a church that believes in Christ, enjoying the freedom, the fellowship, the testimony of a believing church. But if you do not have a personal relationship with Christ, the only words you will hear at the end is, I do not know you, depart from me. The door, the wall, the gate, the path, the way, all describe to us that this city where Jesus will dwell, Yahweh Shema, is, an, is not an inclusive city. Many will believe that they have the right to walk in because they have a, lived a good life. Some have convinced themselves that they can reason and explain their way. Some have even the boldness to say, I will convince him. I will debate it out with God and explain to him why I deserve to get into the city. But except for the son and his redempt redemptive work on the cross, you will not have access into that kingdom. But for those of us who are his, ch his children, that is our final destination. Again, just as what Nishant pointed to us from Hebrews 13 and 14. We move towards that city. Revelation 21, verse 1. This is where truly the prophecy starts. Revelation 21, 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard with a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, Yahweh Shammah, the dwelling place of God, is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall be there mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. And the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter the city by the gates. The Christian journey is a unique one. While every single religion out there teaches you ways by which you can reach out to God, Christianity teaches, out, te reaches, Christianity teaches that God reached out to us. That alone sets Christianity apart from everything else. Yahweh Shammah became Emmanuel, God with us in Christ. And so just as Abraham as it's recorded, by faith, journeyed on to a city that he had not yet seen, we too 
out on a journey to a city called Yahweh Shema. The Lord is there. Let us keep moving forward. May God bless each one of you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your word. We're grateful to you for your promises, trustworthy and true. Lord, we long for that day when we would see you face to face and we would see that city ahead of us and call out Yahweh Shema, the Lord is there as we march towards it. Father, we pray that you would prepare our hearts on a daily basis to live a life that is worthy of our calling, worthy of being able to enter that city, that we would be careful not to be like the world. For we know what is outside that city and we know what is inside the city. We are grateful to you for the promise that you will dwell with us forever. We are grateful to you that you washed us clean so that we now have access to that kingdom. We are grateful to you even as Gentiles that we were added into the kingdom. We were not people of the promise. We were not children deserving of this. Your promise was really not to us. It was to the children of Israel. But in your divine plan, that promise included us into your kingdom. And so we are children belonging to you And we pray, Lord, that we would live lives that is, that is, that is worthy of your, of your calling, of our calling. We commit ourselves this time into your hands, and we commit ourselves and our lives into your hands. And we pray even for this nation, Lord. Even as we look at our nation and we see the, the shame we have brought to ourselves, and the ways in which we have displeased you. And we pray, Lord, that and we commit our nations to you, to you, nation to you, especially given that tomorrow is election day. And we pray, Lord, that a leader that you chose will stand up to lead this nation, Father. And we pray, Lord, even as we lose our way, the few who stand hold to the faith that they profess, Lord, we pray that you would preserve us. And we pray that even through this mess, Lord, more and more people will come to know you more and more people will be added to your kingdom and to that city. We pray and commit ourselves before you and pray for your blessings on each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.